The 2010 movie Predators is considered to be one of the better installments in the franchise, and for all of the right reasons. The film was engaging and continued the Predator lore to a whole new level, or a new planet, if you will. While many wanted a sequel to the film, that never happened, and I'm not sure if it ever will. Nevertheless, earlier this year, Marvel Comics released a five-issue Predator comic that lives and breathes in the soul of the 2010 movie. The comic is extremely engaging and doesn't feel like it simply copies what the movie did. It extends the story beyond the game-preserved planet and even takes the battle into outer space. In this video, we'll explore all five issues of the comic, so prepare to be thrilled. But before we jump into the comic, let's do a quick review of what made the movie so great, really quick. Before we get into our examination, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. Predators 2010 Predators follows a group of skilled individuals who are mysteriously dropped onto an alien jungle-like planet. Among them are Royce, a former black ops soldier turned mercenary, Cuchillo, a cartel enforcer, Nikolai, a Spetsnaz soldier, Isabel, an IDF sniper, Mombasa, an RUF officer, Stans, a death row inmate, Hanzo, a Yakuza member, and Edwin, a physician. They quickly realize they are no longer on Earth and are being hunted by deadly alien creatures. And yes, of course, we know who these creatures are. As they navigate the perilous landscape, the group encounters various dangers, including traps set by a deceased Green Beret and deadly alien beasts. Royce deduces that they are on a moon used as a hunting ground by predators. The group also comes across another captive predator and is attacked by a group of larger, more dangerous predators, or super predators. They meet Noland, a lone survivor who has evaded the predators for years. Noland explains that the predators use the planet as a hunting ground, bringing worthy prey from different worlds. Royce comes up with a plan to free the captive predator in the hopes of using its ship to escape the planet. However, Nolan's madness leads to a deadly confrontation, and the group loses some members along the way. Royce, Isabel, and Edwin continue toward the predator's camp with the intention of executing their plan. Edwin is injured, and Royce abandons him and Isabel to enact his plan. He successfully frees the captive predator, but the group is hunted by a formidable predator known as the Berserker. Royce seemingly sacrifices himself to destroy the Berserker and activates the predator's ship. However, Royce reappears, having survived, and confronts Edwin, revealing that he's a serial killer. With Isabel's help, Royce defeats Edwin and the Berserker. They decide to team up to face the remaining threats as more predators arrive on the planet. The movie ends with Royce and Isabel venturing deeper into the jungle, prepared to confront the new arrivals and fight for their survival. If you want to know what became of Royce and Isabel after the events of the movie, check out our video on the same. I'll leave you a link in the description. Issue 1 Fight or Flight a man in a military uniform descends to the surface in a parachute. He seems shocked about it, as if the parachute ride came to him as a surprise. As soon as he landed, a woman, panicky and scared, warned him to run, run for his life. But there were more people. The jungle was coming alive and gutting one soldier after another, and they were all running away from something, but they didn't understand who or what this pursuer was. Suddenly, a shape appeared, a shape dreaded by creatures across the galaxy. Only a few knew about them because those who face them don't live to tell the tale. It was a predator, probably the most skilled hunter in this sector of the universe. One of the soldiers opens fire, but the predator slashes his chest with his wrist blades. Another breaks his ankle after tripping on a tree, asking someone nearby for help, but that man runs away. The next thing we know, the predator arrives and sticks his weapon into the fallen enemy's chest. One of the soldiers fired his automatic weapon, but of course, it was a futile attempt, and this guy ends up losing his head. The multinational group of soldiers keeps running, and their hunter keeps pursuing, only to take another life when he separated a man's upper half from his lower. Once the survivors found themselves in a relatively safe space, a British man named Alan took them further into the jungles, a place that the predators did not know about. Here, they had a bit of an introductory session. We already met Alan, the big bald British guy, then there was Bo, a military trainer, Omar, a security consultant, Kyoshi Yakushpo, a Japanese self-defense force member, Member, Ernesto from the fictional Citizens Armed Forces Geographical Unit of CAFGU from the state of Philippines, and Oja, 
but the Kafku had been disbanded in the year 2042, and that was several years ago. The soldiers soon realized they had been brought to wherever they were from different points in time, only to be kept in cryosleep. So essentially, they had all been collected to serve as the game for an incredible and incredibly twisted alien hunt. But that's obviously not all. There had to be more information. They needed to learn more. To their rescue came Isla and Lucas, a married couple who served the otherworldly lifeform program, the same unit from the second Predator movie. She tells them all there was to know about the Predators, from their encounters with humans in 87, 97, and 2018. Lucas didn't want Isla to disclose all of that because it was supposed to be a secret, but Isla knew that they would be able to fight the Predators only if everyone knew exactly what was going on. This makes sense, but what didn't make sense was Royce from the 2010 movie decoding nearly every everything about the Predators on his own. Soon, the survivors embarked on a mission to find as much ammunition as possible, because if they wanted to defeat the Predators and find a way back home, they had to get weapons and ammo, and of course, a truckload of luck. However, Alan pointed towards the sky, and there were innumerable parachutes attached to giant boxes, cages, that dropped other deadly beings from various planets. When they approached one of these cages, a giant alien got hold of Ernesto. The creature was extremely powerful, purple in color, had several tentacle-like appendages, and a powerful tail, as if it had come straight out of an HP Lovecraft store. Anyways, in a desperate attempt to save Ernesto, Omar threw a grenade at the monster. It saved Ernesto, but the monster wasn't dead. To their surprise, it was killed by a predator, who also killed Bo. The bloodbath would have continued had it not been for Theta Berwick, a skilled predator killer whose kill count was climbing. Issue 2, Theta Berwick. Rank, Badass Predator Killer. Theta decapitated the predator, stuck his skull on his spear, and left it near the dead predator's body. The green blood that flew from the wound was a sign of shame and dishonor. The predator died a dishonorable death. Two of the dead predator's friends arrived at the spot, took a self-destruct device, and gave their fallen comrade an explosive funeral. As the survivors and Theta continued their journey under Theta's leadership, they came across more morbid aliens, all of whom were targets for the predators to hunt. However, there was a bit of discord here. Theta had come almost out of nowhere and was now taking the charge and leading the humans to safety or back home but she was dressed like a predator. What was that all about? And Omar pointed it out, but she didn't give any straight answers. All she did was remind them of the grave danger they were in, the danger that came with standing in the middle of a predator hunting ground where all of them were nothing but target practice dummies. Oh, and Theta wasn't alone. She was with someone named Paulo. Isla asks him what year it is, and Paulo tells her it's 2062. The group had been transported 40 years into the future, or they slept for 40 years in cryo chambers. Whatever the case, the news was overwhelming for But Paulo tells her there was no time traveling involved. He and Theta had been on Predator ships, studied their logs, and hunted the monsters for over 20 years now. The group walked through heavy rain and dense jungle until they spotted a ship, the one that once belonged to the dead Predator. It was on their path to Theta's ship, and quite evidently, the other two predators would be headed in the same direction. If they picked up the smell, it would become a more elegant mess than it already was. To keep the situation from spiraling downward, Theta asked all of them to continue moving. Interestingly, Kiyoshi was acting quite weird. He distrusted most of the humans and showed some alarming traits. Additionally, Alan was surprised that he was picked up despite the fact that he wasn't really a soldier like the rest. He was simply drinking at a pub when he was picked up. Nevertheless, Theta and the others reached their ship. She decloaks it, and just as everybody was about to get on board, they meet their worst nightmare. Ernesto was shot by a plasma web. The Predators had spotted them. Theta suited up almost immediately and asked the others to get into the ship as soon as possible. While all the others wanted to help Theta, Kiyoshi himself snuck aboard, messed with the controller of Theta's ship to take unarmed authorized command and flew away, leaving everyone behind. On the other hand, Theta, dressed as a predator, takes on a maskless predator, and she stands her ground for a while, but the predator injures her arm. And to make things worse, other morbid and horrific aliens had joined the fray. Was this going to be the end? Issue number three, losers take the bait. But it wasn't just Theta's red blood that was spilling. The apex hunter's body was spewing his green blood all over the place. Although he had a good chance of landing the final blow on Theta, he hesitated for a while, and it gave the alien pack enough time to charge the Predator, as if they knew who the real enemy was. 
Alan made quick use of the short window and escorted Theta from there. Back on Theta's ship, Kiyoshi set course for Earth, and the ship's computer said that the journey would take them just over 252 days, but he wasn't alone on the ship. Oja had snuck up behind him and was now holding a gun to Kiyoshi's head. Lay one finger on that keyboard, Kiyoshi, and I'll blow your brains all over the console. It didn't take long for Oja to take control of the situation, and she came back with Sandy, Theta's ship. The alien pack was still fighting the Predators, landing some serious blows to the hunter. But you see, a Predator is a Predator, and these bad boys can change the tide of the war in a moment. Kiyoshi had been held prisoner on the ship, although Oja wanted to leave him behind for the treacherous stunt he had pulled. On the other hand, Theta had been seriously injured. Paulo began performing surgery on Theta. You see, the Predator had previously severed one of her arms, and Paulo was trying to fix her with another, but the only bone of contention was if her body would accept the new arm. But something else was cooking up between Isla and Lucas. Isla found a huge stash of Predator weaponry and technology, including the hunting routes and target planets. She told her husband how valuable all these things would be for OWLF in their fight against the Predators. To make things further complicated, they discovered that the Predators were heading next to Earth. The next thing we know, Isla and Lucas ambushed Oja, knocking her out and freeing Kiyoshi the deserter. Isla and Lucas had come to seek his help in overtaking the ship and heading back to Earth. You see, Theta wanted to drop off the survivors at a base owned by a multinational named Astra, who would have then arranged their travel back to Earth. But Kiyoshi believed that instead of sending them back, Astra would rather study the survivors as subjects who had been placed in cryosleep or interrogated and then keep them around for information on predators. This was unacceptable to Kiyoshi, and as far as the couple was concerned, they wanted to reach Earth and hand over the Predator tech and weapons to their superiors so that humans could have a better fighting chance against these alien hunters. But hey, there's just one more stakeholder we almost forgot. The two surviving Predators were in hot pursuit of the survivors. Issue number four. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Goes for humans as well. It wasn't before long that Theta woke up after her surgery and was shocked to find out that her right arm was now made of metal. Paulo had fit her with a mechanical arm as a last resort because he couldn't save her real arm. But that wasn't all. It seems that in the past, she had lost her left foot and had to have it replaced with a mechanical foot. Theta asked about who all survived and if anyone was hurt. Alan brought her up to speed about Ernesto and what Kiyoshi had done, but also told her that the situation was now under control. Boy, was he wrong. On the other hand, Kiyoshi wanted to kill Oja because he believed that anyone against them and his cause would turn out to be a giant pain in the ass, but Isla reminded him that there would be no killing. It is interesting that she was willing to join hands with someone who left her and everyone else abandoned not a long while ago. Nevertheless, Kiyoshi suggested that they first take out the security systems, or else the others would easily lock them up from the control room, and it could only be done from the processor room. Kiyoshi was injured and wanted Isla to come with him to the processor room. Lucas wanted to come, but Kiyoshi insisted that even he was injured and couldn't possibly cover Kiyoshi as effectively as Isla, who was perfectly fine. Meanwhile, Theta came to the control center to check on the latest data from the black box. Although she was in need of immediate rest, she believed this was more important. Theta and Paulo understood that something was wrong because the black box was online. You see, it was Isla and Lucas who had been in the control center. Furthermore, they also learned about the possible sabotage of the security systems. Right now, the system had switched to emergency backup. The security system and AI were down, and everything was being rerouted to keep the ship operational using minimal resources. Kiyoshi knew that Paulo was the only one who could fix the system and someone who knew how the ship operated. And since he would understand pretty quickly that someone had been messing with the ship, he would not come alone to fix the issue. But Paulo would not even leave the control center unattended, so it would be Alan or Omar to protect the control center, and he was bang on. Paulo left with Omar to take care of the current issue and left Theta under the care of Alan. But Theta wasn't one to wait and rest till something went wrong. She knew she needed weapons to deal with whoever it was who sabotaged the systems. On the other hand, Lucas was having an argument with Oja, whom he was holding prisoner. While Oja tries to show him how wrong he was to betray their rescuers, Theta and Paulo, Lucas believes withholding Predator tech and info from the world was wrong, as it could save millions of lives. 
but he couldn't convince Oja because a predator ambushed him from behind and killed him. Don't you hate it when a person can't finish their argument? Nevertheless, Isla and her newfound comrade found out that Lucas was mutilated. She initially thought it was one of the humans, but Kiyoshi showed her that there was a predator on board. Isla had just lost her husband, but she knew that the others were at risk. She wanted to help them, but Kiyoshi wanted to shut all access points to the ship, believing it was the only way to stay safe and alive. At the armory, Alan tells Theta who he was before this all began. He was picked up in 1987, and back then, he used to work as an enforcer for a crime firm. They would call him Alan the Axe Adkins. He asked Theta to lead the way, so the old man could fight and knew how to not pull a punch back. Omar, armed with an automatic, and Paulo, armed with a smaller weapon, were looking for the traitor on the ship, but they were unaware of the predator that was sitting right above them, waiting to ambush. Issue number five, there's no glory in a loss. Of course, the Predator attacked the duo, and the bloodbath was again at its peak. Omar became the new victim of the Predator's wrath, while Paulo managed to somehow escape. On the other hand, Theta and Alan the Axe Adkins had donned Predator armor and headed towards the mess. Paulo also rescued Oja from her holding cell, and they met Theta and Alan. Funnily enough, Oja and Paulo were about to shoot them, mistaking them for Predators. Oja tells the other two about the Predator on board and how it got to Lucas. She also told them how Kiyoshi and Isla were trying to stage a coup to take over the ship. However, Isla approached the other four from behind and told them how Kiyoshi had taken control of the deck. Theta was hurting from her recent surgery, but she was back in action. She asked Paulo to rewire power to the doors of the control deck so they could get inside, but Paulo said it would take a little time. And of course, Theta was prepared to move heaven and earth to buy him that time. You see, the control room was the only room with doors reinforced enough to keep a predator out. If they were anywhere else on the ship, they were nothing more than sitting ducks. Isla was sincerely apologetic to Theta for whatever she had done, but Theta wasn't moved. Isla had put everyone in danger. The Predator found the survivors and attacked them, seriously injuring Alan. Oja and Theta continued the attack on the Predator, while Paulo tried to get the door open, but the Predator also took down Oja. Just as the door opened up, Kiyoshi pointed a gun at Paulo, asking him to shut the door back. Of course, he didn't see the jaw-breaking punch from Theta, but it was too late. The Predator was proving to be more menacing than Theta had imagined. The human Predator and the real Predator engaged once more, and the battle was turning out to be long and bloody. Just as the Predator was about to land the final blow on Theta, Oja attacked him from behind using Alan's mighty axe. Oja passed Lucas's gun to Theta, who rained fire on the Predator's head at point-blank range, obliterating. The comic ends in Tusket, Canada, three months later. The only survivor of the ordeal was Oja, who showed intelligence, grit, and resilience. And of course, Theta and Paulo left Earth once again to go hunting. Marvelous Verdict this five-issue miniseries is truly a magnificent piece of work with a story that fits well into the Predator universe. It doesn't diverge for even a single moment from the Predator lore and keeps you engaged throughout. Furthermore, it has just the right amount of blood and gore to keep any and all Predator fans engaged. I seriously loved the character development of people like Theta, Isla, and Oja. You see, Predator movies have always been about men, and the same goes for almost all the comics. But characters like Machiko Noguchi, the human predator, and even Theta bring a breath of fresh air to the predator stories. And I would sincerely recommend that you read this one. That's all for now, but if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and have a marvelous day.